Welcome to Deloitte's Digital Agenda 2020. My name is Christiane Weiler and I am your host for this series of exciting and inspirational talks on the digital future. In this series, you are going to meet five top speakers on the future of innovation and of creativity and of technology. A few of them I can mention, you can watch the talk with Duncan Wardle, former VP of Innovation of Creativity of Disney Company. Tom Goodwin, he is, among other things, the author of da uh, Digital Darwinism. Steve Stadler, he's the author, podcast, and senior vice president at Williard. And uh, Samuel West, the founder of the Museum of Failure. For those of you who have been watching uh, the live stream today, you've already seen um, these guys talking early on. But now we have an exciting last talk for you with uh, Linda Lucas. She is a programmer and a storyteller and illustrator. If you haven't caught all the talks yet, these talks are going to be available in a few days. You can still see them on digitalagenda.dk and then you can catch up on the talks that you haven't seen yet. So, computers surround us in our daily lives, but the most powerful ideas of computing, they go beyond these sleek silver containers and all these glowing boxes that we are dealing with. So what are these ideas and how do we prepare um, our companies for a world where more and more problems, they actually look like computers? This session is going to be about how we can move towards a more humane technology. And it identifies what it means to approach technology from the perspective of storytelling. The speaker you're about to hear, she is the author and illustrator of Hello Ruby, a children's picture book about the whimsical world of computers and of programming. The book series Hello Ruby has been translated to a staggering 25 languages. It's made its debut on Kickstarter and quickly smashed the $10,000 funding goal um, after just three and a half hours, and it got, uh, gathered $380,000 in total funding. And I'm actually also proud, proud personally to say that I was a little part of that because I also supported this Kickstarter campaign, and me and my daughter have really enjoyed these books. So <clears throat> our speaker is also the founder of Rail, Rail Girls, a global movement to teach young women uh, programming in, in over 270 cities. You can watch her TED talk like 1.5 million other people have done, but right now you should watch the talk today. It's my great, great pleasure to introduce to you Linda Lucas. Here she is. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Linda. I'm a children's book author, illustrator, a pretty mediocre programmer. And my job is to make the world of technology that we often think is very dystopian, very machine-like, very mechanical, into something that everyone can enjoy. And this is where I start my work from. The idea that if code is the next universal language, if we truly think that the next foreign languages our children are going to be speaking are going to be JavaScript and Python and Ruby, instead of grammar classes, we ought to be teaching more poetry lessons. And what I mean with that it's the same idea when we learn a natural language. We don't learn a language by conjugating irregular verbs or practicing the grammar rules. We learn a language by speaking it, by singing it, by dancing it, by flirting it. And if truly code is as important as every single keynote speaker has been telling you, we need to diversify with the ways we teach and also diversify the types of people who feel included in the technology world. And stories. Why start with them? Why not make an app or why not make a community of online learners? Well, stories are the original viral way we learn. Stories help us make sense of ourselves. They help make sense of each other and they help us make sense of the world that is surrounding us. But no one was really telling stories about the world of software. And as mentioned, these books have been wildly popular all over the world, translated nowadays into 28 languages. And instead of only writing books about how computers uh, coding works, I've branched out and wrote about uh, how the internet works and how AI and machine learning functions. And all in all, I think what I'm trying to do is build a philosophy of education that combines the depth 
of Montessori with the charm of the Moomin series. And through this, prepare kids for a world where so many of the problems around us are computer problems. And when we look at computer science, it can seem like a very foreign world. Many of you in the audience, you work with vocabulary like databases and binary trees and distributed programming and data structures on a daily basis. But that shuts out a huge number of uh, our world, people who feel like this is not accessible or understandable. So my work is taking these abstract ideas of computer science to the level of the kindergartner. So you can, um, you can explore them with your, on your hands and knees uh, through mud play, through uh, imaginary play, and thus make computer science more understandable. So whether it's thinking about binary numbers through candy play, or whether it's building a craft uh, board you, uh, YouTube, it's making computer science accessible and visible and colorful and imaginative. And like the great Edgar Dijkstra says, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. It's about thinking skills, and these thinking skills are highly relevant, whether you're a product manager, whether you're a business analyst, or whether you're a computer science educator. I think we all have an appreciation towards these heroes of mine, the heroes of the childhood, those of Maria Montessori, Jean Piaget, Tuve Jansson, Loris Malaguzzi. And we understand and see that they understand something very profound about what it means to be a human. But I would argue that also these people, the heroes of computer science, those of Alan Turing, John von Neumann, uh, Ada Lovelace, Claude Shannon, they had these big, crazy, bold ideas. They had the ability to leap and jump with their thinking and the ability to see worlds that no one else saw. And I think it's this that we need in the world, the ability to understand technology through imagination and to be able to see possibilities and plausible futures that don't exist right now. So what I'm going to do in the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to give you the A, B and C of technology education of the future. Hopefully this will be kindergarten stuff, but nowadays we also need to work with the adults. And A, obviously, is for the word algorithm, a scary big world many of us uh, have heard about. We think about the finance sector, we think about Facebook, but really how many of us actually knows what an algorithm stands for? For the kids, this is simple. They say, oh, an algorithm is just a step-by-step -step sequence to solve a problem. It's just like a cupcake recipe. You specify the instructions and the computer can do one cupcake, but can also do a hundred thousand cupcakes. It can do a million cupcakes. It can do banana cupcakes and blueberry cupcakes. And this is the power of an algorithm. Once you've defined the sequence of instructions, you can repeat it over and over again. The computer doesn't get bored, it doesn't need coffee breaks, it doesn't get sick, and so forth and so forth. So in some ways it's the perfect pair for us. But this is not the algorithm I start with the children. I actually start by showing them these five numbers. And I tell them that your task today is to put these uh, numbers in order of magnitude so that the smallest is on the left-hand side and the biggest is on the right-hand side. And typically, it takes the children anything between five to ten minutes to complete this task. And then I asked the children to do the same with these numbers, and then the same with these numbers. And by this point, they are grumbling. They say, Linda, this takes forever. And I tell them, bingo, now you got it. This is your first lesson of today. Never compete with a computer on a task like this. Computers will always outperform us in being faster, more efficient, more precise in things like ordering large quantities of numbers. So we humans don't want to compete on a task like this. But we humans, we still need to give the instructions to a computer. And the instructions, they are called an algorithm. And this is how a computer would approach a task like this. It would start from the beginning and it would compare 1 and 56. And it would say 56 is bigger than 1, let's give it like this. It would then move on and compare 56 to 4. And it would say 4 is smaller than 56, let's move it like this. It would compare 56 and 70, say this looks fine. 70 and 20, let's swap these two around. And then it it would move all the way to the beginning of the sequence of numbers and it would go through this sequence over and over and over again until the numbers were sorted. 
And this here, ladies and gentlemen, is called the bubble sort algorithm. It's like a working horse algorithm born sometime in the 1970s. And most importantly, it isn't written by the computer. It was written by a human. And in this way, I'm hoping the children will get a sense of an algorithm uh, that is just fast, precise way of solving a problem. But this is not enough either. It's not enough to understand what an algorithm is or how an algorithm uh, functions or, or how they are powerful. I think it's really, really important that we start to ground these algorithms in practice and in context. So I show them a search engine. And a little bit like the Where's Waldo type of an activity kids do, I ask them, where is the algorithm hiding in the search engine? And the kids look for a while and they say, maybe in the search results. And I say, yes, the search results, they are ordered by an, an algorithm that takes into account your search query, but also your past search history and your geographic location. And it tries to make a guess on your age and your gender and so forth and so forth. But it's still a step-by-step -step instruction to showing you the best possible search result. And the ads. Those take into account the kind of things you search and who you are in the world, and they try to make you click those ads. And then we look at a social networking side, and we do the same activity. And by this point, the kids are really confident. They say, it's not a coincidence that I'm shown that Lego ad on Facebook after going to Lego website. Or they know that uh, the order in which your friends' updates are shown, that's defined by an algorithm that tries to optimize for your retention and how long you spend on the site. And then finally, we look at YouTube and we try to find the hiding algorithms from the side. And we recognize that when you type something into YouTube and YouTube makes a guess, that's an algorithm. The kinds of videos that get suggested to you, that's an algorithm. Also, um, the kinds of videos and ads you're shown are an algorithm. And more and more, the types of videos that get created to you, those are decided by an algorithm. Because you see, when I ask children how many of you in the room have seen something uncomfortable on YouTube, something weird, something that doesn't feel quite human, most of the children, they raise their hands. There's these videos like surprise Play-Doh eggs, Peppa Pig, Stamper Cars, Minecraft, Pocoyo videos that make absolutely no sense. But the thing is, YouTube gets 400 hours of new content uploaded every one second. So there's no way a human can go through all of that. So they need an algorithm. And there's entire industries that are only gaming this algorithm, which means that our children, they are getting content not intended for a six-year-old, but for a machine. And that's the level I want the children to understand an algorithm through. This is nothing new to educators. There's a famous educator called Jean Piaget, researcher who said already in the 1970s, for, he spoke about math, but I think the same applies to computer science, that you can't offer an entirely organized intellectual discipline by giving kids pre-organized vocabularies and concepts, but rather true learning is grounded in action. And it's this action when we talk about ICT, we talk about social media skills, we talk about computer science, we talk about machine learning. It's action that we're lacking when we're talking. We talk in such abstract terms that we need to ground these things um, uh, a little bit lower. So A was for an algorithm. B is for Boolean logic. And it's my love song to the computer. Because I love computers. I love what computer scientists have done in the past 70 years. They've built these layers of abstraction on top of each other to the point where we have these magical devices in our pockets. But none of us have any understanding of how the computer works anymore. And I bet there's a lot of people in the audience who have these memories from the 1960s and 70s of computers you could tinker around with, computers you could take apart, transistor radios you could fiddle around with. For my generation, we can jam 300 million transistors at the pinpoint of a pen. But as a result, computer science, they've have, the computers, they've become very, very foreign to us. And sometimes, 
I kind of wish I could shrink myself to the size of a silicone chip and really go inside of a computer to learn how it works. Unfortunately, with modern day physics, that is not possible unless you're a children's book author. So that's exactly what I did with the second Ruby book. In it, Ruby is really bored. She goes into dad's study, she types her password in, but the computer doesn't work. All of a sudden, the white mouse, it wakes up next to the computer and says, Ruby, I've lost touch with the cursor. Can you help me find the cursor? And Ruby says, of course. I'm the best computer debugger I know of. And together, they make themselves very, very, very small. And they fall deep, deep, deep inside of the computer to the layer of electricity, where there's billions of tiny switches that only know how to go on and off on and off. They either pass electricity or they don't pass electricity. And Ruby says, oh, we could find the cursor in here, but it takes forever. Let's climb higher. So they meet the logic gates that takes, take these tiny bits and they do a little bit more complex mathematical operations with them, but still at the level of first or second grade math. And Ruby says, we could find the cursor here too. Let's climb higher. And they meet the hardware layer of the computer, where there's the bossy CPU, the processor of the computer that gives commands like fetch, execute, store. But it is very forgetful, so it needs help from the RAM memory and the ROM memory and the hard drive to get anything going. They go dancing around the operating system and finally they do actually find the cursor. I'm not going to tell you how, you'll need to read the book for that. But most importantly, I think the kids get this very robust sense of the abstractions of a computer. How electricity turns into logic. How logic turns into hardware. How hardware turns into software. And how software turns into the apps, games and programs we use every single day. And as a result, I hope the children don't think that computers are made of magic. Because while computers are magical, they are not made of magic. They are made of logic. And that's a huge intellectual leap to make when you're six years old. And why does this matter? Why do we need new metaphors and ways to talk about what computers are? Why can't we just stick around with the idea that a computer is a device that has a keyboard and a mouse and a screen on it? Well, because already today there's hundreds of computers in every single home. And five years ago when I started this work, when I would show children these four pictures, a picture of a car, a grocery store, a dog and a toilet, and I would ask the children which one of these devices or objects or things are computers, the children would say none of those are computers. But five years has gone. And now children say, oh, a car is a computer because it has a navigation system. And there's even self-driving cars, did you know that? And they say, grocery stores, they are computers. They have sensors when you walk into the store uh, and the doors close or open. And the ice cream box, that's a computer. And the teller's machine and the burglar alarm system. And do you know what? I actually order my food through an app. That's a computer. And we talk about how dogs are not computers, but dogs might have microchips under their skin, so if the dog runs away, you can find it. And then my perennial favorite. I tell the children that in Scandinavian countries, toilets are mostly mechanical devices. But go to Japan, where you can play music on a, uh, on a toilet, you can um, modify the heat of the toilet, and there's even hackers who hack toilets. And this is my biggest mic drop moment with the children. They get absolutely nothing else done throughout the rest of the day, because it's just too tantalizing an idea. But this is the truth. There's hundreds of computers in every home. We call it the Internet of Things or something else fancy. But these children will grow up in a world where their toothbrush is a computer and their teddy bear is a computer. And one of the most lo-fi ways I've approached this activity is by collecting children these everyday objects like tuna cans and scissors and uh, uh, eyeglasses. And I ask them to imagine what would these objects do if it was a computer. And I had a little girl who chose the bicycle lamp and she stuck the little sticker, an on-off button that I offered to her on the bicycle lamp. And she tells me, Linda, if this bicycle lamp was a computer, 
I could go on a biking trip with my father. We could sleep in a tent. And this bicycle lamp, it could also be a movie projector. And that's the moment I think we all are looking for. The moment when we realize three very profound things we tend to forget in the everyday hustle and bustle of life. First of them is that the world is not ready yet. There's so much we haven't invented or discovered when it comes to technology. The bicycle lamp movie projector might not be the most important thing out there, but it still does not exist. And the second thing she realizes is that technology is a wonderful way to make the world progress. If we understand technology quite broadly, it's actually the only way humankind has ever advanced. And there is this idea, a sci-fi author once said, that everything that happens in technology before you turn 30 is exciting and fun and according to the natural order of the world. And everything that happens after 30 is suspicious and weird and unnatural. And boy, do we actually need Fortnite and TikTok and all these other things. And I'm 33 and I'm noticing myself going through this thinking pattern that the world is quite good as it is. As it is, is. We don't need that progress through technology and everything looks like a toy. But there is so much we haven't invented and technology is a wonderful way to make the world progress. And the final thing she realizes is that she herself can be a part of this change. Odds are she's not going to be the next Steve Wozniak or the hardware hacker of the future. But for a moment there, for a little moment, she felt like she could be the first inventor of the bicycle lamp movie projector. And I think it's that sense of wonder and curiosity and fearlessness we all, even adults, need when it comes to technology. And when we look at the progression of technology throughout the ages, we seem to have these 15 year chunks of time from computers that fill a room to computers that sit on the table to computers that are carried in our backpacks to computers that fit in our pockets. And the next phase from 2025 to 2040 is probably be computers that become a part of our environment, whether it means wearables, whether it means uh, sensors that log us, whether it means um, furnitures that recognize ourselves. And we need imagination, fearlessness and curiosity to prepare for this next, next big wave of computers. But most of all, we need new narratives and new ways to tell the story. And it's interesting that when you want to understand the future of computing, you actually need to look at the past of computers. And many of the tools I use to teach what computers are about come from 1945, 70 years ago over, when John von Neumann was working on his big idea of the von Neumann architecture of a computer. At the time, computers were bigger than this screen, now a screen, um, a stage. Now they fit into our pockets. But the basic operating idea of a computer is still similar. The idea is that you input data, you process that data somehow, and out comes the modified data. And then there's these stored programs that give instructions on what to do with that data. That's what we call software today. So when you sit in a car and you forget to buckle your seat belt, in goes the sensory data that someone is sitting in the car, there's a process that tells what to do, and out comes the modified beep beep sound. Or if you go um, on Facebook and you like a post, in goes the information to servers on Facebook um, that someone has liked this post, out comes the updated like count. And it turns out our world is full of these input devices, these output devices, these sensors that collect data about us and turn these input-output uh, processes into computers. And by this point, the kids are really bothered. They say, Linda, you talk too much, let's do something. So we build this incredible input-output device, this gigantic cardboard box, where the kids actually physically become the input data. There's a piece of instruction like saying, uh, come out crawling the wrong way around, or come out uh, jumping on one leg, and then they become the output data. And through this physical process, literally on their hands and knees, they understand one of the biggest ideas of computer science, the process of input and output. And maybe the most important thing we're teaching our children shouldn't be about how to learn to code. Maybe it is this idea of a notional machine, 
The idea that in order to survive in the future, we need to have these robust mental models of what computers can do, what humans can do, and why that's different. And that brings us to the final letter of the day, C, which stands for creativity and computers. And it starts with a buzzword we've all heard about recently a lot, AI and machine learning. And these words, they make me really think about medieval map makers. Because you know how in medieval times they made maps about the world, and every time there was something we didn't quite understand, we would say, here be the dragons, don't go here. And when I read the papers, I see all of these doomsday stories about how AI is doing this and that, and adults talk about the Terminator and the Skynet. But I think our children, they deserve a more pragmatic and more optimistic idea about the future. So instead of thinking that AI and machine learning are some sort of sentient creatures, they would understand that it is about data, lots and lots of data that we produce. And that data gets packaged into different products. And they would understand that even though we talk about AI in anthropomorphic terms, about AI seeing, reasoning, communicating, creating, it's actually technologies that enable this. And these technologies are actually fairly simple to explain, even for a six-year-old. In the past, if we wanted to teach uh, a computer to recognize a cat, we would need to write these long, long instructions of definitions of cats, saying that a cat is an animal with two ears and a tail, and it comes in these five colors. And instructions like these would break down easily. They would be fairly brittle. And computer scientists came up with a better idea. So instead of trying to define what a cat is, nowadays what we do is we collect thousands of examples of cats. So the researchers went on YouTube and loaded thousands of hours of cat videos. And they fed those cat videos to the computer. And the computer built a model about what it imagines a cat looks like. And we don't exactly know what happens inside of that model. But we also don't know what happens in our brain when we recognize a pineapple or a hairbrush. And then the computer gives an answer to the question whether this thing here is a cat or a not. But very importantly, it actually doesn't give an answer. It gives a probability, an estimation, if this thing here is a snow leopard or a cat or a monkey. And when we look at this whole loop of machine learning, we can see that there's so many areas where we humans still are much needed. First of all, computers are not curious. They will never state questions like, is this thing here a cat? We humans are needed in gathering of the training data for a computer. And then finally, we humans are needed in assessing whether this thing, um, whether the answer is reliable enough for the computer to decide. Because there are areas where a 60% probability of a picture being a cat is okay. But then there's areas of our healthcare system, of our judicial system, of our education system, where we just need much more robust models. And we practice this, again, in very simple terms with the children. I show them these four pictures of cats and I ask them, what is the bias? What is something, un uh, well, something surprising the computer might learn if it only looks at these four examples of cats? And the kids say, hmm, maybe that all cats are grey. And I say, yes, now draw a picture of a cat that is brown or stripy or yellow. And then I show them pictures of teacups and I ask the same question. What is the bias a computer learns by only looking at this training data set of teacups? Would it recognize grandma's teacup that has flowers on it? Or a Japanese teacup that doesn't have handles on it? Or would it even recognize a teacup that has a handle on the right hand side? No. And these seem like innocent examples. But as we are automating more and more of our systems, more and more of our society with AI and machine learning, it's really important that we have diverse people building these training data sets so that we don't accidentally create hospital systems that only recognize women as nurses or only recognize certain eye shapes when it comes to camera AI intelligence. And examples like these are everywhere in our society. I think demystifying AI, helping children see that it's still the same input-process-output 
the idea that a self-driving car takes input from car cameras. There's a process that maps the position of other cars. And then the seeming ability uh, to drive comes out is in the same line of thinking as earlier. That while AI is magical, it's not magic, it's logic. And that brings me to the final few thoughts I want to offer to you, to, to, uh, to you today. I think when we look at AI, it's easy to see that it can do a massive amount of things. It can literally save the bees, diagnose skin cancer, write sports bulletins. But it is the cooperation between us humans and the machines that are going to help us into the 21st century. And to get there, we need agency and we need vocabulary. A few years ago, I read this article where Oxford University researchers had shown children pictures of Pokemon species and natural world items, like trees and animals and plants. And by far, the children were so much better at recognizing the Pokemon. They had more vocabulary to describe Pikachu than the birch tree, more vocabulary for the Bulbasaur than the badger. And the researchers were worried because what happens in a world where we don't have vocabulary to describe what is happening around us. And I'm worried about the same thing. I do think that we need to feel closer to nature, but I think the exact same thing is happening in the world of technology, where we have a lot of these suitcase words, these words like blockchain, digitalization, Bitcoin, AI, that are like suitcases we throw from one person to another, never to be opened, never to be unboxed. So take, for instance, the internet. When a little boy came to me and said, Linda, is the internet a place? I would say, no, it's this interconnected network of computers. You can think of it like the cyber village or the information superhighway. And then I realized, oh boy, I'm talking about the internet of the 1990s. This child has never disconnected from the web. It's something that is everywhere around him. And I need to update the stories I share. So is the internet the servers, the fiber optic cables that go from the bottom of the sea all the way to the space? Or is it about the protocols and the software that governs how data travels around the world eight times in a second? Or is it about the cat videos, the explosion of memes and creativity that happens when six billion of us can finally be in contact with one another? And this is the challenge of technology. It's not only the hardware we're speaking about, it's not only the software we're speaking about, and it's not only the societal impact technology is having. It's all free together. So I think we need better definitions. And one definition comes from the Greek. They said that technology is tools needed to do the job, but not only tools, also human skills and competencies. They said agriculture is a technology. Democracy is a technology. Another definition of technology comes from Jose Ortega y Gasset, a Spanish philosopher, who says technology is the production of super superfluities today as in the Paleolithic era. This is why animals are atechnical. They are content with the simple act of living. And if I understand these two definitions correctly, they are saying that technology is about us humans as well as our tools. And that technology is about our human ability to imagine. So I'm going to leave you with the final definition of technology that comes from a nine-year-old. Um, little girl in Helsinki that I think beautifully combines these, these two ideas. And it goes like this. She says, technology is electricity that loves. It is used to play. I use it to have a conversation with my mom. We use a WhatsApp application. And then finally, and most importantly, people uses technology. Thank you very much. And a big thanks to you, Linda. Thank, Thank you, you very much. What an exciting talk with so many <laughs> promising ideas and ways to think. And uh, I, I was thinking I would ask you, when companies are looking for new employees, mm -hmm. when they're hiring, uh, they might have some problems they need to solve. They need engineers, they need programmers, they need people in the technology department. Would there be other types that should join the same teams? Like, what would you recommend? Because sometimes if you add 
people from from the humanities mm. or or liberal arts in the same team as someone that works with technology you you, you get a, a different kind of innovation what do you have to th say I about absolutely that? Uh, believe that is paramount I, I think first of all our university systems should think of computer science in the same way they think about English as a language of communicating as language of understanding the world so there's definitely going to be those stereotypical people who go really really deep into the world of computer science and algorithms but I think computer science is a tool in a set of toolboxes so I would wish to see more liberal arts students more humanities students who embrace technology and computers as a tool of self-expression and as a tool of problem solving and when it comes to hiring there are these really really sort of strong myths around what a technology person looks like and I think the spearheading organizations of future will be the ones who understand that all companies first of all are in some way or another in the technology technology business, but also the people who understand uh, and see the potential in uh, just unleashing the imagination of different kinds of engineers and building these cross-disciplinary teams. Have you personally ever experienced that someone said, you don't look like someone that works <laughs> in technology? <laughs> Code like a girl is my <laughs> uh, uh, ethos. Um, sometimes yes, and I think there is a lot to do in changing uh, the stereotypes we have around computer scientists, especially because programmers back in the days were women. They were uh, women who were really good at calculating ballistic curves of the um, Second World War and then somewhere down the line we thought that we should make software engineering more prestigious and started to hire mathematically abled people and there was just I think yesterday or the day before this study that says that actually language abilities correlate better with programming abilities than math abilities so a lot to do in sort of breaking the stereotypes mm. on personality and gender when it comes to technology. And that's very interesting because you are helping girls get into this area also and your books, Hello Ruby, mm. the series that I've enjoyed with my daughter. We've uh, sat together, we've solved some of the mm. programming problems that you can do through the book and it really gives you sort of an idea of what is programming and what does it actually mean and how can you create things from programming. Uh, how do we make that change with the little girls like so that we get it, we get that change early so that when they grow up they also think that it's a normal thing for them to apply for a science or technology education yeah. or a job? I think it's a two-sided question. So I, I mostly work with children between six and nine, which is quite young. But then I was really sort of uh, devastated to hear that girls' own self-image image when it comes to math abilities. Actually, it's a lot in the early childhood. It's not like at age 10 or 12. It happens really early on. And I think we need more role models. We need more different ways of talking about technology. And to to be honest, we also need uh, a change in thinking in the boys. So I'm often asked, so you write these books that have like a girl heroine like Pippi Longstockings or Little Moo, are they books for girls? But I think the proudest moment for me as an author uh, was when I was traveling in Japan and little Japanese boys, and you know how Japan can be quite gender, like stereotypical and strict, they came to me and said, um, because we don't share a language, I would ask them like, who is your favorite character and can you point the favorite character and I'll do a little doodle of her and most of the little boys said Ruby is my favorite character. So I think that is the future when both little boys mm. and little girls can see that girls can be equally uh, good at problem solving um, as boys. So that we can get to a world where we no longer need to talk about gender but just need to talk about creativity and Absolutely. innovation. Thank you very much Linda Lucas. Thank you. And thank you to you for watching this uh, Digital Agenda uh, 2020. You can go to digitalagenda.dk and watch the talks that you haven't watched today if you haven't been able to follow the stream live the whole day. You can still see the talks separately. They will pop up in a few days on digital.dk. And you can see this whole series of future-oriented uh, keynote talks from our handpicked selection of top business profiles. Um, thank you for joining us now, and thank you for joining us if you're going to come back for the recorded video later. We hope to also see you next year at the Digital Agenda 2021. My name is Christiane Weiler, and it has been a great pleasure to host you today. Stay creative, keep innovating. Thank you.